Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. I'm joined this evening by Eve Pollard, the former Fleet Street editor, and Peter Hunt, a former BBC royal correspondent. Hello yet again to you both. Quick look through the front pages. And many of them, including the Sunday Express, have this image of the Queen sat alone during Prince Philip's funeral. A slightly different angle on the Sunday Telegraph, which reflects on what it calls a heartbreakingly beautiful day. For the Sunday Mirror, it's the loneliest goodbye. Let's turn to the Sunday Times now, which has a front and back page wrap. On the front is a photo from outside St George's Chapel. The back has an image of the Duke of Edinburgh's coffin being carried inside with his family following behind. We've got a close-up shot of the Queen on the front of the Mail on Sunday, which also has an image of Princess William and Harry. And a picture of the Queen heading into the chapel dominates the front page of the Sunday People. Meanwhile, the Observer carries an image of the Queen. It does also report on its front page on warnings from a senior Tory MP to Boris Johnson that he'll lose support from Red Wall voters if he fails to deal with lobbying scandals. So those are the front pages. Uh, let's begin our chat. And uh, I wonder, Peter, if you could kick us off this time around. And it's the loneliest goodbye on the front of the Sunday Mirror. Well, it's an image that everyone can relate to, and it's an image that is very haunting, isn't it? This is the head of state mm. who's lost her soulmate, and in her hour of greatest need, she's in isolation. Her relatives are more than two metres away from her in a different part of the church, in a different pew. And the image and the experience of anyone who watched the funeral will bring home to those who haven't been bereaved or have grieved during this COVID period the isolation that has been imposed on people like the Queen and others uh, due to the COVID restrictions. Eve. Um, yes, it, the strongest um, picture that has appeared in all the papers this morning is the Queen sitting in her stall on her own. It is where she does normally sit, but uh, the Prince of Wales is sitting opposite her. I think Prince William is sitting quite far away. Her children are spread across this uh, church, this chapel, which can normally take 800 people, and there are 30 of them. So they're socially distanced and following COVID guidelines. Um, it's it's very difficult because you see the Queen, she's got a black on, of course, and a larger brim, it seems than usual. And you can just about see the expression on her face. But of course, they're all wearing masks. And the feeling of isolation, the feeling of this is how it's going to be for the rest of my life is very strong and anybody who can describe how it must be to lose their lifetime partner particularly after 73 years of marriage uh, would say this is a very lonely position so on a day like today so as we turn to the front page of the sunday telegraph we have what you were just describing there eve but um peter what we have here is we have the queen looking down on her lifelong companion. Precisely, and we see his coffin in that image. We see the standard draped over it. We see his naval cap and sword, and we see the simple wreath that she placed on it, the queen with the words, in loving memory. And when we look at that coffin, it reminds us and the wreath and everything that this service was paired back, not just by the pandemic, but also by the prince. It represented what he wanted at his funeral service, which was a strong emphasis that it just demonstrated and showed his affinity with the sea and his closeness to the military and in particular to the Navy. Um, Eve, let us go to the front page of the Sunday Times. Forced to mourn alone, the Queen bids Philip goodbye. I mean, many people around the country will have gone through what she went through into if you know if they'd lost anyone we were forced to mourn and honor our our family our lost you know in smaller smaller groups it, it would have hurt well very definitely i mean i did feel very much today for people who my sister-in-law sadly died during all this and uh, had a very very small funeral and of course no music and of course no military because there's no military background of course this is an extraordinary occasion it's the burial of the queen's consort the man who's been by her side for 73 years a man who's 
influenced this country in many ways, from the Duke of Edinburgh's award schemes to all sorts of other things he's done. And of course, he himself designed this funeral. So there are light touches, but very emotional ones. When I saw the, the driving carriage that he used in his Edinburgh Green with his gloves and his hat and, and a blanket on the seat, um, that made you really think this is the essence of the man. But it was also, I think, at the end of the ceremony, they had action stations, which apparently is the call that you used to hear. And remember, this is a man who fought in the Second World War. You would hear it when uh, they wanted every sailor on board to be at their station. And I felt that was a message to us, which is get on with things, which is something that Prince Philip always used to say. People don't want to hear about you. They don't want to hear about me. They just want to get on with things, get on with their lives. And that was a very strong message from today as well. Let's turn, Peter, to the front page of the Express. And we're still uh, carrying on with this, uh, this theme of being alone. However, the paper is saying you're not alone. You know, the British public are there. But we've also got a picture um, in the far right corner of the pallbearers. What did you think of the military precision of what we saw today? I think the one thing we must remember about the military procession and everything is how reduced it was and how shrunk it was compared with how it would have been pre-COVID. There were plans pre-COVID. This funeral was planned for many decades. It used to uh, amuse Prince Philip that some of the people who planned it predeceased him. And in the early plans when we didn't have COVID, there would have been a much greater military display, which would have involved the carriage at one point, his coffin at one point, being dragged on a gun carriage by naval ratings through London, then placed on that Land Rover hearse that he was involved in the design of over many years after it was produced at the Solihull factory and driven 22 miles from London to Windsor. Instead of 22 miles, it was a couple of hundred metres with this military procession, which took off from the Windsor State Apartments down through the grounds of Windsor Castle to the church. And on the subject of You're Not Alone, of course, the family have been making many statements, very warm statements about their father, their grandfather. And in all of their statements, they've insisted how they will really rally round for uh, the Queen. She marks her birthday next week in private while in mourning, but then also very significantly next year, she will mark the 70th anniversary of her reign. So as we turn to the front page of the Mail on Sunday, the other focus of today was Princess William and Harry. What did you make of that? Was that, was that a distraction at all, Eve? Well, I think it was very interesting that when the palace announced the formation that would be behind the little procession behind uh, that amazing Land Rover with its precious cargo, um, Prince uh, Harry and Prince William were separated, as it were, by Peter Phillips, uh, Princess Anne's son. And of course, for them, always a bigger boy, the big cousin that they all spent a lot of time with, who had been brilliant and had been up in Scotland at the time of their mother's death and had been very helpful in trying to take their mind off it. They're very, very close to Peter Phillips, without any doubt. And we all know from cousins, the eldest is always in prime position. So everybody made a great to-do about the fact that the boys were separated, but I could hardly see the boys would be getting into fisticuffs, walking behind their grandfather's uh, coffin. What is interesting is at the end of the service, the royals were supposed to go back to uh, Windsor Castle in cars, but because it was warm and because they'd been sitting in um, a church for an hour or so, I think they all decided to have a bit of a walk and to walk up the hill. And I'm not sure they were even aware that the cameras were still on them, but we saw Kate talking to Harry and getting Harry to talk to William, and they seemed to be in having an interesting discussion. And I think we all thought if Harry and William can somehow mend fences and put things back to how they were, this would be brilliant. And if this very sad day accomplished one thing of all to get these brothers together, that would be good. Of course, who knows? There's a lot to be sorted. But it was great to see them walking up the hill and talking to one another. Yeah. OK, let's turn to the Sunday Times. Uh, change of subject, Peter. Cameron sought access to NHS data, data at height of the first wave. 
Yes, I mean, this is the ongoing uh, saga with uh, the Sunday Times and indeed the Financial Times have been doing the running on this and other broadcast organisations and newspapers have been catching up this ongoing uh, lobbying scandal, as they call it, about the former Prime Minister uh, involving this Greensill company, which is uh, since gone gone uh, into bust and then threatened many jobs, not least in the steel industry in this country. Uh, Mr Cameron must be wondering how so many of his emails are leaking, um, but they hit, this is another one which is claiming that he sought access to NHS data at the height of the first wave, and it also quotes uh, senior figures in NHS England saying that despite the talks they had, um, there was no attempt to sign up to what he was offering uh, centrally with NHS England. Well, uh, just to bring in uh, two statements that have come off the back of this. Last night we had a, a spokesman for David Cameron who said that these discussions were about the mechanics to ensure earned was delivered for NHS workers in a smooth and efficient way. And also a, a, a representative from the Greensill family has said that earned was never supposed to make a, co a profit for the NHS. Lex, uh, Lex Greensill, of course, is devastated that the earned project didn't succeed. Seed. I, I'd like to end on the final uh, paper tonight, and that is The Observer. We're still uh, continuing uh, with the subject, but this is a warning to the Prime Minister. Act now, or you'll lose those uh, key red wall votes. Eve? I think that um, I don't know now. I mean, there are now so many different stories coming out. I guess there will be some sort of inquiry. I mean, there is going to be some sort of inquiry. I think that in other countries, uh, there is lobbying. Um, there are people who are involved in both sides, sometimes the government and business. I think what we all feel is this now has to be A, totally transparent, B, very, very clear to members of parliament, to companies, to everybody, that this has all got to be declared and above board. Now, uh, David Cameron said he didn't do anything wrong, but he did directly uh, try and speak to or did speak to the chancellor and other members uh, of the government i guess what it means is access has got to be clearly defined and the way you get access has to be clearly defined and i think it's not just the red wall i think we all want to see that these things are very clearly done and nobody is taking any advantage of anyone i don't believe he has but we will see i mean the only way you'll discover it is to go and to all the backstories and see exactly what happened in this case and possibly see what's happened before uh, this case arose. I mean, maybe this is the way that business has always been done and some of us have been not clear exactly how it's been done. So I suppose the question is observing the spirit of the rules, but maybe that's not good enough because it's been described as shameful, Peter, the current situation, the blurring of public and private lines. And I think the other striking thing in the Observer article is that this is a, a senior Conservative who's issuing this warning. It's a warning mm. that obviously will be seized on by the Labour Party as we approach uh, the votes and the, and the, the, the mayoral elections and various other uh, tests of the electoral opinion in the coming weeks. Um, and it is something, as we know, that uh, the Labour leader has tried to make an issue and attempted to stick on this government, whereas obviously what this government wants to do is focus on the suggestion that this is all to do with the Cameron era and not is not representative of what is now the state of politics at this very moment. OK, and on that note, thank you both very much, Peter Hunt and Eve Pollard. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us uh, this evening for tomorrow's uh, papers. Uh, coming up next here on BBC News, it's the Film Review. Cheerio.